Good evening, everybody. Glad to see so many people here. We still have some people uh, coming in and joining. Uh, so I'm, I'm just going to um, slowly start here while people are still joining us. I think there were some problems with people getting on, so I'm going to give a few extra minutes here so that everybody can uh, can get on okay. Uh, one of the things that we're going to be doing, uh, we're going to be utilizing the chat box for all questions during uh, the lecture today. I'll repeat this in a few minutes when people are, uh, when I know that more people are on. Um, but feel free to uh, give questions uh, through the chat box. I, I do have moderators who I will be introducing uh, shortly. I'm going to put on a, a short little uh, introduction video. And uh, then while we're still waiting for some people to join, you can watch this two minute video and then I'll be back with you in, in just a couple of minutes. Everybody is looking for a Brigadoon. Everybody is looking for a place of peace. We feel here that we don't really rescue animals as much as they rescue us. We have people come in here who are so upset, who, you know, are just stressed out by the world, and they leave here saying, oh my God, Oh, this is the most wonderful place in the world. And we have animals who we're just kind of protecting here. And someone will walk in and the person will look at that animal and the animal look, will look at that person. And the animal walks over and says, I've been waiting for you all my life. The amazing thing about these animals is that they are totally forgiving. These animals have lived through tortures and starvation and brutality. They are so happy when they get here. If it's the hay or if it's the grain or it's just being petted or just, you know, for the first time in their lives being, being respected and loved, uh, they are so grateful. The animal is always there no matter how bad we are, how stupid we are, you know, what happens? The animal's right there saying, it's okay, I'm here, I'm your buddy, I'm your friend, I'm part of your heart. Uh, if there are no animals in heaven, hey, I'll go somewhere else, forget it. You won't find me there. <laughs> Brigadoon, Brigadoon. Da da dee 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 dee, Brigadoon, Brigadoon. Okay, so once again, welcome everybody to uh, our our little time together here to further delve into understanding our animals and their emotions and their emotional world. And um, it's wonderful to see so many faces here. Actually, some of you I can't see because you have your cameras off, but <laughs> the ones that I can't see, it's great to see your faces. And um, we've missed all of you because we've you know been on this COVID little COVID vacation here. So it's good to see you all. Um, before we get started, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we will be using the chat box for you to ask questions. Um, my plan is to uh, talk for about 20 to 30 minutes or so, and then I'm going to turn this over to your questions so that we can take this wherever it is that you'd like to go. And uh, I'd like to introduce, I have two moderators that are going to be taking your, your questions, and uh, that would be Peggy Brown and Margaret Uncle, two of our directors. There they are up in the upper left hand corner wherever they show up on your screen. And they will be monitoring the chat box and funneling your questions to me. 
And uh, so if you don't know where the chat box is, it's on the bottom of your of your Zoom menu on the bottom of your screen. You'll see a, a thing that says chat. If you click on that, it opens the chat box and you can type your questions in there. All right, so as we get started, um, the first thing that I would like to do is a, a very short exercise here, which you'll see where I'm going with this after we do it. Um, I would like you not only, I don't wanna just talk about animals' emotions, I'd like to have you experience what it's like um, to be an animal and how they are with their emotional environment and being present. So we're gonna do a short exercise and you don't, you can close your eyes if you want to, or you can sit there with your eyes open, whichever you'd like to do. And I just want to have you take some slow, deep breaths, just a little deeper and slower than you would normally breathe, and just find a rhythm for yourself of breathing, just breathing in and out a little slower and deeper than you normally would. But I want you to picture and imagine your breath coming right out of the center of your chest, right out of your heart. And you're going to breathe in and out of your heart. And I just want you to do that for a few breaths right now. And as you do this, I would like you to think about an animal that you're very connected to. It could be an animal that is with you now or an animal you've had in the past, but an animal or a human or a place where you feel enormous love and appreciation. And I want you to feel that feeling for that animal or the person or place and feel your love and gratitude and appreciation. And as you feel that, just feel that with every breath you take and I want you to take a few more breaths a little slower and deeper than you than usual. While you're feeling that love and gratitude. And now just be aware of how you feel. And you may not feel any different than when we started or you or you may feel a little bit more peace and calmness about you. But this is an exercise we do a lot in my workshops and it's an exercise on being present and bring, being in your heart. And animals come from this place very easily. It is a natural place that actually for humans as well. And it's, it's a place of basically it's a place of coherence where your brain and heart waves sync together and are in unison and it brings you a sense of peacefulness. It can calm you when you're feeling anxious. Uh, and this is a place where animals live from all the time. Now they come in and out of that nobody can hold that space all of all of the time, including animals, but for animals they're a little bit more readily of able to tap into this moment of being present. So animals can have all of the same emotions that humans do. Those of you who have animals, which is probably everybody on this call, I would assume. Um, but for those of you who have animals that live with animals and experience this, I'm sure you have no doubt that they experience all the same emotions that we do. What makes animals different is their ability to live in the present moment and to focus in the present moment. So some people, when I say this in workshops, I've had people say to me, well, you mean they don't have a concept of time? And no, that's not what I'm saying. They have a concept of time. They have a, a huge concept of past, present, and future. And for those of you who have dogs and cats waiting for you at home, well, even horses, I mean, livestock, um, they definitely know what time you're supposed to be home. And they, they have a, full concept of time, but they are able very much to live in the present moment. So your dogs and cats and horses aren't sitting around generally. These are all general statements, by the way, they're exceptions, obviously, but generally they don't sit around worrying about all the things that you worry about during a day. They're not worried about what their investments are going to do, 
when your retirement fund is you know coming due or they're not worried about what bills have to be paid um they're not sitting there worried about things that are coming they instead are very much present in the, in the present moment and their emotional life is much freer than that of a human being i mean we humans make this very difficult all this emotional uh, the world of emotions. And you hear a lot these days about emotional intelligence. And I mean, you can look up a lot of stuff online about emotional intelligence. But basically, emotional intelligence is how well are we aware of our emotions and how well are we, um, what do we do with them? You know, how mature are we with our emotions and how do we express them or not express them? And what do we do? A animals have a great deal of emotional intelligence. Think about this. Animals are straightforward for the most part. There are exceptions, but animals are straightforward with their emotions. So my dog, I have a yellow lab named Jesse, and I have to mention him on this call or else, you know, when I get off, I'm in trouble. So he uh, told me once when he said, when I'm happy, my tail just moves. I can't, I have no control over that. So, uh, Animals express themselves easily in general when they have an emotion, and that's including when they get angry at us or when they get frustrated with us, right? I mean, cats are really good at, at expressing themselves uh, when they've had enough or when they're angry or whatever, um, they will express themselves. So they're very free about um, expressing their emotions, experiencing their emotions. But we as humans frequently misunderstand what is happening with them and also misunderstand uh, how emotional, what emotional beings that they are. And just like humans, they vary by each animal, not so much by species even, but by individuals. So just like with us, some of us express ourselves more easily than others. Um, some of us are aware of our emotions more easily than others, and that's true for animals as well. But one of the things that we tend to um, miss is uh, how they, how important like their relationships with each other are, how important their relationships with us, how they view things, um, what emotions they, they carry with them. And I wanna get into one topic that I think is near and dear to my heart being co-founder of Spring Farm Cares and that is dealing with animals that have been through trauma. And animals experience trauma just like we do. So they have, they can have PTSD, they can uh, have a lot of residual effects of, of trauma, but they also can heal from trauma. And in my experience, they heal from trauma much quicker uh, than humans do and much easier. And a lot of that goes back to what I just said at the beginning about them being present in the moment. So they tend not to hang on to things. It does not mean that the trauma doesn't still affect them, uh, but they tend to hang, hang on, you know, they tend to let go of it quicker, where it takes a human 50 years of therapy to get through something. An animal will do that much quicker when they're in a safe environment. Once they're out of their trauma and they're in a safe environment, then they move along from there. Uh, one of the things I want to talk about, I don't know how many of you have rescue animals, but those of you who have rescued animals, um, first of all, God bless you and thank you for rescuing whatever animals, but we got to be careful because I see this all the time. And I've been to a lot of workshops all around the country and all over Canada and where I'm teaching and people would come up to me all the time and say, this is my rescue dog. He was, or, or they would say this, this was my starvation dog. And I'm looking at a, at a lab that's about, you know, hundred pounds and clearly not starving, but they'll introduce this dog to me as their starvation dog. And every time we do this with our labels and we introduce an animal according to their trauma, we actually end up emotionally and energetically keeping them in their trauma. We keep basically making that their identity and we don't think about that i think it becomes a rescue complex for humans you know 
you know, look at me, I rescued this dog from horrible things. And we love to tell their horrible stories to, to everybody. Uh, that's a very common human thing. But every time we do that, we're actually keeping them in the trauma and in the memory of that trauma and it keeps it alive. So just be aware of that when you, if you're, if you're thinking about that, um, if, if you take one thing away from this lecture, that would be a good thing if you have an animal that's been through something like that or has a past that you don't know about. The other thing that I see happening a lot is people will see an animal shy at something like you adopt a dog and um, your neighbor comes over and he happens to be six foot three and walks in your house and the dog cowers and immediately we say oh he must have had a horrible experience with men you know he doesn't like men and that could be true but it also could be true that he has trouble with tall people and uh, because they can't see their eyes i get animals telling me this all the time so we have to be careful not to assign an emotion to them that may not be theirs or to assign a situation to them because that affects how we treat them just turn this around and look at this from a human perspective if you had a friend that experienced the past of trauma you wouldn't at a party come up to a group of people and say hi this is my friend debbie and she, and she was abused when she was five i mean you wouldn't do that so we need to become aware of and conscious of what we're constantly talking about our animals or how we how we view them and let them heal we need to be able to let them heal because that's really important um the other thing that i find causes a lot of emotional discomfort for animals is when it's if you think about this it's really tough uh, i'm going to take the example of horses i don't know how many horse people we have on the on the line here but horses are a really great example because we generally um, board horses in boarding situations. They can be in a barn for any period of time. If you if you're, have show horses, for example, you can be taking your horses out, putting them on a trailer, going to a show, coming back. What happens in these horse barns is that a lot of the times these horses get on trailers and they never come back again because they move but there's been no warning the horse didn't know this was happening and he didn't tell his friends this i can't tell you over the years how many calls i've had with with horses who are despondent and depressed and people don't understand that that's what's going on and i'll check in with them and they'll say something to me like i i lost my i lost my buddy my buddy's gone and i'll when this first started when I was doing this I would ask people you know did you have another horse that died and they would say no no nobody died but then it would end up oh I know the horse in the next stall moved to another barn but these they don't understand that and they they sometimes grieve and mourn these relationship losses very deeply and then we end up getting I end up getting calls you know from people saying um my horse is doing really silly things and, and he's not acting right and we, and we don't understand what just happened that they they incurred a, a major loss so some animals have friends and family units that are extremely important to them that we may not recognize as being connections for them and we need to also be aware of that so uh these are just some of the basic things i wanted to start with i want to then see if you all have questions I'm going to ask that you please don't ask specific questions about specific animals because I, I, I'm not able to do consultations during this call, but if we could um, keep them general. Um, I would start taking some questions if, the, if you have some. And in the meantime, John, yep. We have someone asking a good question. Would you agree with giving our animals negative names like stinky or devil um <laughs> that it has a negative impact on them yes thank you for asking that question that's one of my favorites at what we name our animals is incredibly important uh, because with a name is a feeling or an emotion a picture uh, i have to tell you some of the most difficult horses that i've ever worked with were horses named nightmare 
I don't know why people like to name mares that, but I mean, I understand why they name them, but <laughs> um, nightmare. Uh, there was um, there was a horse that I got called to work on that was uh, spinning constantly. So it would dump the rider, the person would get on and the horse would just start twirling in, in circles. And so I, um, they started telling me that this was the problem. So I started asking, you know, what is the horse's name? So the horse's name was Whirling Dervish. And I said, and so you named him that because of this behavior? And they're like, no, that was his name since he was a foal. <laughs> it's like, well, this could be part of the problem. So I know it sounds stupid. It sounds too, too simple. Because this was a behavior problem that here's this horse at two and three years old that they couldn't ride because he would just spin and spin and spin and spin. So I said, I would suggest that the first thing you do is change his name. And they actually changed his name to Arrow. And I swear to you, this is a true story. The behavior went away. They didn't even do anything else. They just changed the name and the behavior went away. With a name is a picture. So we have this here at, at Spring Farm. We have 170 cats, for example. And when we were having a lot of uh, when we get cats that come in, we don't know their names or sometimes they're kittens or whatever. And so the staff would start to name them. And it's kind of funny because they would do theme names, like, you know, like we're going to have the uh, the tree litter. So we'd have apple, maple, elm. I mean, those, you know, that's fine. But then they would get into sometimes they would get into these other things. Um, I remember the, a cat that we had here who actually had um, um, I can't think of the name of it now. I want to say uh, he had like a cerebral palsy kind of thing. And they named, uh, they wanted to name him Wobbles. And it's just not appropriate. You know, we don't uh, name, we don't name one-armed people Stumpy. You know, so why do we do that with our animals? Because it's, it, we think it's cute, but it actually does, um, it can perpetuate a trauma or a, a disability. So yes, be careful what you name your animals. Peggy? Uh, Don, we have some other questions, please. Go ahead. Uh, there's a question about whether there might be a genetic component uh, to some of the fearful rescues, and if there's a genetic component. I didn't catch that, Margaret. There, could there be a genetic component to animals being fearful, like rescue animals being fearful? Absolutely. And that's an excellent, a very good question as well. So a genetic component to animals being fearful, um, there definitely can be. And the way our neurology works in any mammal, I mean, the way this works and for humans, animals, it doesn't matter. There's a cellular memory that we retain of, of everything that we've been through. So whether it's trauma or good things, it doesn't have to be just trauma. We store a memory physically in our bodies, in our cells, and so do animals. And I have actually had cases, um, Bonnie and I had one many years ago, uh, we were working with um, a mare named Kazinka, who had a foal named Viva, we had both of them living at the farm. And I, we had, um, Kazinka was on cross ties and we were grooming her. When all of a sudden I went, I went up to, I just went to touch her face and she flinched. And I mean, she flinched bad. And as she did that, her foal, who was actually like two years old at the time, he wasn't a baby baby, also jumped and flinched at the same time. And uh, it was really interesting when I asked them about it because uh, the mayor was remembering a, uh, an accident she had been in or an incident she had been in with somebody when she, start, she got really badly startled but her foal had that same memory in, in his body. So there's definitely a genetic component. There's also a genetic component, component to how they handle stress, but there's lots of studies in people the same way. So in utero, for example, um, if there's a uh, human in utero that the mother goes through a trauma that, the, that that memory is contained within that baby when it's born. So there's a lot of, a lot of um, research done on that. Don? Yes. Um, this one, I think, is a very good question. Um, this person is saying that they were never cat people, really. 
Um, but for the past couple of years, neighbor cats are always coming to their house and teaching us so much, teaching them so much. So the participant is wondering why so many cats are attracted to them and to their house all of a sudden. <laughs> Obviously, because you need cat help. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Cats are very good at this. And uh, I don't know any of you have had the experience. If you have any friends or anything that come over to your house, if they're allergic to cats, the cats will go to them first. And so I, th I saw this so many times over the years. So finally I asked cat once, why is it that you cats go to the one person who's most allergic to, or fearful of cats? They'll do, also do that. The one person that's terrified of cats, all the cats will descend upon them and, and they have to be near them and sit on their lap. So when I asked this one cat this question once, I said, why do you do that? And it was a female cat. And she said to me, we feel so bad for them. We want to fix them. So you just need cat help. So that's why they're there. Don, another participant brings up a very good point. Um, and it had to do with what you were saying about the names um, and just saying um, this participant had been doing just that and is asking, how do we move forward? Do we not address what they've gone through? And the, another participant on the same topic mentioned that it sounds like, yes, she has a, a pet that has a really strong name and that animal lives up to that too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true. Um, and the first part of the question, I'm sorry, I just lost the first part of the question, was what? The, the first participant was asking, light of the fact of naming or talking about an animal's trauma, um, how do you move forward and not address what they've gone through? Okay, so you can, it's fine to, um, a, you need to acknowledge, it's fine to acknowledge what they've been through. It's just that if you keep talking about it over and over again, especially after they're through it and they're, they're different. So uh, I, I have a favorite one, and this person may be on this call actually, um, favorite story I had was with a, a lab um, who in a workshop uh, chose a participant and kept telling the participant that um, he was living a very dreadful life where they never fed him. Now, this was a very substantial lab, obviously really well fed and extremely happy. He was like an incredibly happy dog and loved and cared for and just a wonderful dog. And when I got to this workshop, he came and kind of adopted me, sat next to me and said, I'm going to co-teach this with you. So I'll help you with the group. So he, uh, he chose this one person and she eventually on a break came to me and she said, uh, we have a problem because this dog just told me he's starving and they never feed him. And so I started laughing and she said, I'm not kidding, this is a very serious problem. I mean, they're not feeding him. So I said to her, please look at this dog, just look at him. And so she said, I know, what are we gonna do? I said, he's obviously very well cared for and very well fed. And when I went to the dog and said, why are you doing this? He said, I'm just joking. You know, I'm just joking. Can't she get the joke? I'm trying to make her laugh. She was taking things way too seriously. So she was getting the messages correctly, but uh, not. she was failing to recognize his wonderful sense of humor. Um, they, you can recognize their trauma. That's a part of what they've been through. And it's a part of what you've been through together in the healing process. But you can also talk about it in a way, you wouldn't believe how far my dog has come. He, you know, when I got him, he was so shy and he wouldn't let anybody touch him, but look where he is now. You know, acknowledge the healing, acknowledge where they are. Also, if they're still, if they're still in the process of healing, there are some animals that don't get over the trauma, just like there's some people that don't get over it. They carry it for a long time. And you can still be saying, you know, telling people, he's just really shy, he needs some space. In other words, give him, in the introduction, give them what the help is that they need, not just always identifying them by their trauma. That's what I'm just saying. It's not that you don't, you can never talk about it 
or talk about it in front of them, but just don't make it their identifying qualification or, you know, the thing that you always mention. Another question. Uh, one of your participants has a dog that has actually physical scars from previous abuse. And so people naturally ask about it. What would be an appropriate way to talk about it or not talk about it, but to handle the situation, especially in front of the animal? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's fine to acknowledge it. And you can, you can actually just say, you know, those are from, unfortunately, some bad experiences that he had before or that she had before. You don't have to go into all the details. You can just acknowledge that there's scars from the past. John? Yeah. Um, this is a good question because I know I'm guilty of this. Do animals get offended when we do baby talk to them? <laughs> so let me ask it this way. How many of you, I can't see hands. So how many of you, I wanna say, you'll just have to you know, raise your hands to yourself. How many of you on this call talk baby talk to your animals? Because I'll bet you it's almost everybody. Mm -hmm. I see nodding and hands. Uh, we all, yeah, we all do that. Um, and you know, like anything, I guess you you some of them don't like it, and but you usually know. And sometimes you do it because you know they don't like it. Um, you know, it just kind of play it by ear. But they they um, in general they don't mind that. They also don't mind our funny little nicknames. How many of you have like five or six little nicknames for each of your animals? Right? You have variations of their names. <laughs> um, we do that. I do that. I'm guilty of that. And and uh, they understand the intention behind what you're saying. I think this is really important to understand because we were talking about names and what you what you say about them. They also understand your intention behind what you're saying, so they'll get the feeling of that. So, uh, you know, when you have your funny little nicknames for them, they understand that that's a loving, you know, loving gesture. They also understand if somebody and, and I get people, I've had people do this. Um, I've had people with my own dogs that I run into in public or whatever, let's say I'm out at the vets or something. Or I'm at that probably not the vet office is a great way to look at it, but if, if I'm somewhere where somebody doesn't actually like animals very much and you know that they really don't like I have a lab, so he tends to be very forward and he he can walk up to somebody and and uh, bump into them or whatever or jump on them. And um, when uh, when that happens and I have somebody that doesn't like that and they say something like, you know, I, I don't know. Well, he's a great dog, isn't he? And they're really they're really meaning they hate this dog. The animals get that right away. You know, they understand the feeling or the emotion that's underlying the actual word. And that's what they'll get first. They'll, and you do that too with people. You pick up what the underlying emotion is before you hear their actual spoken words. Okay, Don, we have another question, please. Yep. Uh, the lady would like to know. I often feel my dog is my mirror. I'm, I'm anxious, she is anxious. If I'm calm, she is calm. And the question is, do pets absorb our emotions? That's a great question. Yes. So, and I'm guilty of this. Um, since I have a thunderstorm phobia myself, Margaret can attest to this, all of our dogs do too. And um, it's not necessarily the dogs that had it first. So uh, it's, um, they definitely pick up our emotion. So I'm gonna tell you a story. Um, we had a pit bull here. He was, uh, he was uh, deaf, sorry, he wasn't blind, he was deaf. His name was Scooter. And Scooter lived in Bonnie's office for a long time. And he was, he was a great, great dog. I mean, he was just an amazing pit bull. And he, um, he was funny because he was trained to hand signals, but if you put him out in the dog yard and he didn't want to come in, uh, when you gave him the hand signal to come, he would turn his back to you so that he couldn't see you. And uh, then the staff had to run around and try to get to the front of them. And he would just keep turning around and he, you know, he knew how to tune people out. Like, I'm gonna stay out here longer. But one day he, he was very um, responsive to energy, extremely responsive to energy. So one day we actually, he was sound asleep in Bonnie's office on his bed, curled up in a little ball, sound asleep. And I come, I come barging in the door, he's deaf, so he didn't hear me come in, but I come barging in the door, 
all excited because I had some really exciting news and I couldn't wait to tell Bonnie. And so I walked in with all this energy and all of a sudden he sprang off his bed and he started running around in circles and he literally ran across Bonnie's desk and onto the dresser and onto all of this furniture winging around and Bonnie just calmly looked at me and said, do you want to go out and come in and try this again? And so I had to go back out of the room, take a few deep breaths, calm down and then walk in and he was very fine then and he went back on his bed and curled up. But my energy coming in with all of that force, actually he absorbed all of it and he just became that energy. So that happens when we're happy. It happens when we're fearful or anxious. Yes, they can absolutely absorb that and, and act it out. Animals are really good at acting out emotions. Not all of them, because there are also those that are good at repressing them, just like we are. But in general, they are very quick to, um, they're very quick to express themselves. Uh, Don, there's a very, very good follow-up question to this part on the emotions. And this is, uh, I'm wondering if they can absorb our physical ailments or if they're absorbing our emotions, can they make them, our physical ailments actually make them physically sick? So that's a, a huge topic. It's um, probably bigger than what I can, I'll just touch on that in here. The answer to that is yes. Um, our animals, and again, energy illnesses are also energetic and energy is exchanged very easily. So they, they often do um, pick up our um, uh, illnesses. They can, they can um, take them on and sometimes they take them on and try to heal them for us. Again, this is too big of a topic for, for this particular class, but all of that is possible. Uh, next question would be whether cats understand different voice inflections, like the tone and the tenor of a human voice. Yes, uh, animals do understand that. The cats sometimes are fond of ignoring that, but yes, um, they definitely understand it. Um, and uh, that's true with any animal, actually, that I've been around. John, uh, just going back to genetic fear, is there anything we can do to help the offspring move past the fears of the mother? There are, um, there are many modalities around. Uh, uh, tea touch um, is one of them, um, but there are, there are lots of, of other things. There are lots of modalities out there that deal with that very thing and deal with cellular memory, uh, deal with um, moving trauma out of the body, um, you know, there's cranial sacral work, there's, uh, there's, there's so much acupuncture. I mean, there, there's so many modalities out there, holistic medicine, uh, I would energy work, I wouldn't be able to name them all, you know, even touch on that. But there are definitely things that you can do to help that. Don, uh, yes. a couple others, I'm going to ask these two together, and then you can deal with both of them. Um, how do we support a very fearful and barky dog who doesn't seem to feel comfortable, especially when he hears or sees other dogs? And another participant asked, I'm often confused why my dog on walks will ignore some dogs and get agitated with others. I react in a way I don't want to because I don't want to look like a bad dog owner. Don't we all feel that way? Uh, <laughs> And I want to know how to honor their reaction, but also encourage the dog to stay calm. So we have the barky dog and then someone walking the dog. Those are the two questions. Okay. And the, the answers are, are pretty much the same. And there's no foolproof. I would love to be able to say to you, okay, for all of you that have that problem, here's what you do. Because there's no easy answer like that. If I wish there were, because I have the same problem with my dog. So I have a yellow lab. When I take him to the vet, he, I mean, this dog is wonderful. He's super social. You know, he, he's lived with as many as nine dogs in our house before. He, he gets the whole dog thing and he's fine. And I, he has had um, medical problems his whole life since he's a puppy. So he's been to the vet a lot. And I mean, all the time I would be in the, in the waiting room with him with other dogs and he'd be fine. And then all of a sudden, one day out of nowhere, he just suddenly charged at another dog. I was totally stunned, embarrassed. And isn't that really what it comes down to though? 
because the first reaction many of us have is we get embarrassed for ourselves. Like, I can't believe that I just looked like this. People are going to think I'm this horrible dog owner and uh, or ho horrible animal person. And if you're dealing with horses, you know, and you're in your barn and your horse does something, then automatically we think it reflects upon us. And then we react from that place. And if you can try to avoid that, it's easier said than done. And instead, go to your animal, even if it's after the situation, you know, get them out of that situation um, and get yourself out of that situation. And then look back on that behavior and just say, from that, from my animal's perspective, what just happened? Because there's likely that there was a cause outside of that situation that, that interfered or caused or sparked a, a, um, a response like that. And it may be something you're not even aware of, but sometimes if you step back away from the situation and look at it, you'll suddenly realize, oh, you know, the guy yelled at his dog just at the same time my dog started barking at him. There was just, it, the, your dog was responding to an energy outside of itself. Instead of what usually happens, you get the behavior that you don't want and you suddenly think, what did I do wrong? You know, or, or stop that. You try to stop the dog immediately. And one of the first things we do in a situation like that is yank them, which usually then intensifies the, the response. So I don't have easy answers to all of these things, but just to know um, there's a way more going on in your animal's environment. So like when you're walking your dog, they're taking in a lot of different stimuli. They're taking in a lot of different things. They're, they are feeling your emotions. They may be feeling the emotions of an approaching dog so that's another thing I see a lot of out in public. Um, we were involved for a while in going to some uh, animal fairs where people all brought their dogs, you know, it was like at a park and everybody brings their dogs. And I get so uptight at these things that I actually have to leave because you'll get, you know, I don't know, 70 people walking around with dogs and half of them are on flexi leads. And the dog is like going out 12 feet ahead and the person is asleep at the wheel and they have no clue what their dog is doing and suddenly they you know this dog can approach your dog and they're not aware that these animals are in an, an environment that's not something they're used to and they're also responding to all the stimuli around them they're responding to 70 people walking around with dogs on flexi leads that don't know what they're doing and they're all <laughs> it's a mess waiting to happen so i mean there are a lot of things that your animals are constantly processing while you're trying to do things with them and those are outside influences. If you're not aware of what's happening, your animal can be getting afraid, um, apprehensive. And if you're if you don't catch that, uh, one of the things that I think is important to know for humans is like if you have a dog that suddenly loses it on a walk, take them out of that environment, turn around, go another way, or alter your course in some way that alters that. Um, you know, it takes them out of that situation that's causing it to flare up, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Okay, Don, next question, please. Uh, the question is, have you ever talked to an animal that went miles to find an owner after they have somehow been separated? In the say, Margaret, and, I, you, hold on, you cut out. Can you say that again, please? Yeah, well, they have talked to an animal that has traveled miles to get back uh, to be reunited with their owners. Uh, I, and what what they have to say about the journey that they took, meaning the animal's journey. So I um I've had one that I worked with. It was a cat, interestingly enough, that disappeared, um, and the cat was gone for a couple of weeks by the time a person called me, and um, so I got very clearly from this cat that it went up this mountain and it described this whole thing went up a mountain on a hiking trail and uh, went really far and then went over the trail like over the top of the mountain down the other side and it was long like this took a couple of days for this cat to do this at least a couple of days and um, got to the other side and now it was not sure how to get back so i asked it why it couldn't get back and the cat's answer was very cryptic to me it said because people never go the other way so when i said this the person on the phone went oh my god i can't believe this okay 
we're going to go look someplace. We think we know where you might be. So they ended up getting back in touch with me. So what this cat was doing, and it wasn't the first time they did, this cat did it. After this phone call, actually, the cat did this three other times. They finally put a, a collar that had a, a note on it because they were near a major hiking trail. I think it was part of the Appalachian Trail, and it went up over a mountain and down the other side. But the hikers always went one way. They they did, and they would have the hikers then would have um, a, a vehicle pick them up on the other side of the mountain when they came down the other side. So when I talked to the cat, the cat was like a search and rescue cat. The cat was like they go by and they never come back. So I have to go find out where they're going because maybe they're getting lost and I have to bring them back. So that's what the cat was doing. So they found him 12 miles away. And um, once they got this down, they, 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 they had the cat kind of do this in a different way. And we assured the cat that the people were, were fine. They were actually, you know, getting picked up somewhere else, but then the cat would get lost. So that's the closest one I've had on a personal one about uh, talking to an animal that's gone a, a great distance. I've, I've had others um, that, have uh, found their way home. I actually had an elderly dog um, it was a collie, I believe. I can't remember actually, but anyway, it was an older dog. Um, we're talking not probably like 18, 19 years old. And for, it was a large dog. So that was ancient. The dog was blind and deaf. It was a female. The people went on vacation and left a neighbor girl staying at the house. And um, the second morning away, there was it was in the winter and there was a snowstorm. And this dog never left the driveway. So the instructions were, you know, just let her outside the garage and she goes out, does her business, comes back in. So the girl did that and um, all of a sudden the dog was gone. And uh, she, anyway, the owners were still on vacation, ended up calling me for a consultation. And I kept getting that this dog had gone way far away and had gone down a ravine and was stuck which made no sense because this dog couldn't walk very far and so they assumed that she died that she went off to die somewhere but it kept feeling to me like she was indeed somewhere and had walked somewhere um anyway the they came home from vacation and she was found seven miles away about a week later and she was totally fine and indeed she had gone down in this ravine and that's where she was. So uh, it's it's very interesting sometimes uh, what these animals will do. Dawn? Yep. Um, question, how can we best help an animal if their special person has passed away, particularly if the animal has been very deeply bonded to that person? Oh, that's such a great question. Uh, animals are all different in how they grieve and, and how, they, um, how they move on. Uh, so this varies by animal. We've seen different versions of this here at the farm. So let me just tell you that when we've taken in animals from um, people who from estates where owners have died and we, we bring the animals in here, um, there was one case where we took in a pair of cats. Uh, they were identical, they looked identical. They weren't litter mates, but they looked identical. And one was uh, 19 and the other one was 21 when we took them in. Now, normally we did not have a good feeling about this. We had a feeling that most likely these cats weren't going to make, be able to make the transition from living with this one elderly gentleman who they lived with their whole life to now coming to a place like ours where you know they have they're going to be with lots of cats and they're going to have to make this adjustment but we decided to try it and we took them in and they absolutely thrived here and when i talked to them uh, about their one of them would always say i couldn't tell them apart when they first got here because they were they looked identical and one would always say i'm the younger one and I always thought that was funny. Since you're 19 and 21, neither one of them was young. But anyway, the 19 year old would always tell me he was the younger one. And uh, they felt that they were doing this for their person who passed because they wanted him to know that they were okay. Like that was a big deal for them. And um, they actually lived, uh, the younger one lived a little longer, <laughs> but they, um, they, 
the one died at 24 and the other one was 22, I believe. And they, they actually did incredibly well here. We've also had cats come in here where an owner has died and the, um, and they just all of a sudden stopped eating and we could not get them to eat. And then they shortly after passed and they just wanted to be there with, with them, with the owner. The other thing I will tell you is this um, story I'll never forget. There was a cat here, um, it was a Siamese cat, a female Siamese cat. And she came in when her owner had to go into a nursing home. And she was a young cat and she was actually highly adoptable. And, but every time anybody came to look at her for adoption, she would do something crazy like bite them or she would suddenly get up and go over and pee on a bed in the room and which she normally didn't do. And uh, so she'd never get adopted. So finally one day I, I was asked by some of our staff to go find out what, what the issue was, you know, what was the problem? So I would, I would go, I went and talked to her and she told me that it was very, it was imperative to her that she stay here um, where her owner knew where she was that she could not leave here because that person in the nursing home would not know where she went and that that would be too painful. So she stayed here and we honored that. We didn't adopt her out. Actually, we, we didn't honor it once and we adopted her out. And within two days, um, she bit one person in the family and she peed on the pillow of the other one and she was promptly returned. And we got the message and said, okay, we're gonna honor this. Then um, she was here for a couple of years and um, all of a sudden one day the staff calls me over and said that she was laying in the middle of the room uh, in a coma they, they couldn't they couldn't get her to move. So I went over and I, I looked and sure enough, it looked like she was dying I mean she was pretty much comatose I could I could pick her up move her and she didn't respond. And this went on for about she was breathing and everything and I thought she was dying I sat with her. And this went on for about a half an hour, 45 minutes. And then all of a sudden she just kind of stretched. She got up, she walked around the room and she came over, she climbed in my lap and she said, it's okay now, I can go to another home. And ironically, I shouldn't say ironically because this is kind of weird that this happened. But two days later, we got a call from a family member. We had not heard from this family since the cat came. But we got a call from a family member asking how that cat was doing because their mom had just passed away two days before in the nursing home. And this cat knew that. She totally knew that. And she, she spent that 45 minutes somehow energetically connected to her and, and helping her pass or whatever she was doing. And then after that, she was, a, you know, she said to me, I'm adoptable now. And about a week later, um, a family came in with a woman with a couple of children. And um, this cat absolutely was drawn to these kids and they started grooming her and petting her. And this was a cat that wouldn't let us, us do that, <laughs> but she was all over this family. And it was very clear she had chosen them. And so she went and lived with this family and had um, just, we kept getting updates that just an amazing, she was amazing. So, John, yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I know that we're getting close to the time. Yep. At a few of these other great questions. Then, if that's okay. okay. Um, is it too confusing to change a dog's name? I often think we should get to know a pet, then figure out a name, but we want to name them right away. So, when I um, when we have animals here that come in, I usually ask them what their name is, so I have that advantage. You know, we have that little advantage that I'll ask them, but <laughs> they um, they frequently then if I if I ask a kitten or a puppy their name, um, they I remember this one cat was uh, Zorro the Great, and I thought, oh God, that we can't name this cat Zorro the Great. That was like a little too much, but that's what his personality was. But uh, about six months old, he softened that a bit. And he wanted to be named Patches or something. It was some some silly thing like that. So you just need to know that, especially if they're young, their identities keep changing like that. Um, it's hard to, hard to know on the name um, about changing their name. Um, certainly when animals come here 
if we don't, if they're strays and we suddenly get them, I'm assuming that when they've come from someplace, they had a name at some point, uh, we have to change their name because we don't know what their name was before. So we, we deal with that. Um, when horses come in and they have a name, I, we almost, I don't think, I've only changed it once. <laughs> and, um, but we've never, I don't otherwise change the name. These horses have had these names. Like most of the horses that come in here are older. So for 25 years, they've been known by a name. It's their identity, it's who they are. Unless they request that I change the name, I don't do that. So uh, it just depends on the situation. John, um, another participant asks, asks, if your intent and energy are strong enough, can you affect your animals for long distances? Say for horses, if they are bar boarded far away from you, can they feel your love? Absolutely. So heart connections don't know any space or time. So they absolutely feel you. When you're on vacation and you're away and you want to um, send your animals a connection, they feel that, they absolutely feel that. And uh, when you think of them, they feel that. And it's actually helpful when you're away that you do that because then they, they know you're still with them. But yeah, that, absolutely, they feel that. Um, Don, when an animal is stressed by thunderstorms, will our remaining calm help them overcome their fears? Oh, so yeah, sure. Rub that in. You had to ask that. <laughs> it's raining out. <laughs> I know. It's starting to storm here, and they all know that I have a storm phobia. It's, it's, so it's really good that I'm just focused on the computer and not trying to look out the window at the torrential rain that's happening right now. Um, Actually, yes. So I got to tell you this, um, same is true with the 4th of July and fireworks, or it doesn't have to be the 4th of July these days, they seem to have fireworks whenever they want to have fireworks. So we have neighbors that have fireworks a lot. And um, it brings up such anxiety in me and anger because the animals are getting freaked out. I can't, it, you know, it's, it's good. We can comfort a trembling dog, you, but they still are anxious, but we can comfort that. But a 1200 pound horse that gets scared is very difficult to comfort. And so I get my anxiety level gets skyrocketing and I, I just make the animals worse. So this 4th of July, I actually did this experiment where I said, okay, I'm going to go into this beforehand, do my breathing beforehand, get really calm. I'm not going to get angry about the fireworks. I'm just going to say, you know, okay, guys, I know this is upsetting. Here we go again. And that actually had a big impact on, on the animals this year. So absolutely, your reaction de definitely can be um, helpful or a hindrance. Don, do animals accept our logic or science? For example, if we explain that a car can be struck by lightning and the passengers won't be harmed because of the science of how their car is built, would the animals accept that? No. <laughs> How's that for an answer? Uh, not always, because um, just like you can't. So think about this. If you're afraid of lightning and you're in a car and you're driving and somebody says to you, don't worry about it, you if you get struck by lightning because of the way the car is built you're not going to get killed or anything nothing bad is going to happen it's not going to stop your fear more than likely because fear isn't an intellectual thing fear is just an emotional an emotional thing and when you're afraid somebody coming in and proving to you the science like if you're afraid of heights and you're up on the top of a bridge and you're walking along and somebody says to you your chances of falling off this bridge or this bridge collapsing are like getting struck by lightning. I can tell you that I was struck by lightning, so you're not gonna convince me of, of, this, of this impossibility of the bridge collapsing. So you can talk to me all you want about intellect and science, but if I'm afraid of something, it's not going to do anything. So same holds true with them. Okay, one more question. I think it might now be the last one. Can okay. you hear me, Don? Yep. Okay, the question is, I have heard of some animals able to communicate with the animal buddies after that after they died and others that are in deep mourning do you think they can all communicate but that they, they, they handle the situation differently yes very much so so they do um they do communicate with each other from spirit they definitely um can send messages back but just like us they some of us get buried in the grief part and we miss the connection and they uh, animals have the same exact 
experience. So some of them will feel that connection right away and they'll know their, their friends are okay. And others of them get lost in the grief and they don't feel that right away. They all have the ability to feel that. Okay, I'll be good. Okay, so I wanna thank all of you for being here for this hour. Um, I am very appreciative uh, for all of you joining in and for your support. Um, we will be having more of these. My, my next one actually is gonna be July 24th. Uh, it's a Saturday at two o'clock in the afternoon Eastern time. And that's gonna be how animals view death and knowing when it's time to let them go. That's gonna be a powerful workshop and I, or lecture. And I will tell you, it's also a very uplifting talk. So uh, we will be doing that. And I look forward to seeing anybody that's coming to that. Uh, one thing I would like to say is to, when we started out with this breathing exercise at the beginning, I just wanna invite you when you get off this call, just to sit for a moment and breathe from your heart and just take a few breaths like that, feeling appreciation for your animals. And some of you have animals joining you right now. On, on, I see you all with some, some of you with animals right there sitting at the screen. Uh, for those of you who have ever done any meditating and have cats, you know, there's a common thing that happens when you sit and you do the meditation and you get quiet. What happens? Suddenly your cats join you, you know, and you have cats sitting around you. And because the animals get to this place where you're suddenly quiet and you're in your heart, and they say, oh my goodness, thank God, they're finally quiet, they're, they're, there they are. And they wanna share in that space with you because we're always mentally chattering and it drives them nuts, I think, sometimes. So take a moment. There are, um, I don't know how many people are actually on here right now, uh, about 70 people on here right now. There's 70, 70 of us on here right now, connecting and sharing a space. And if we can just all take a moment together when you, when you get off the call, Take a moment to just breathe and be present and just think about the love and the uh, gratitude that we can bring in as we're connected from being together on this call. So thank you all very much. I hope you have a good evening. Um, I know we're in different time zones, but wherever you are, have a good rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.